Um, okay, our, our next spe speaker, uh, Christopher Hayden, uh, Christopher Bajan. Um, he serves as a research associate for the BI and as a member of the GN Press book production team. He is a retiree, a former archeologist, school teacher, adjunct instructor at Florida State and clinical social worker in community mental health. He has a BS in zoology from Cardiff University and a master's and PhD in social work from Florida State University. Thank you. Um, I have to say that I feel like the Keith Hartley band coming on stage at Woodstock after Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, my talk is about, let me share my screen. Oh, I need somebody to let me share my screen, please. It says host uh, disabled participant screen sharing. One second. Okay. Comes. Ready? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I want to talk. In fact, my 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 presentation is about. Uh, what I've had, what, I, what I've um, been finding that Prabhupada said about time in his, in his books and in his teachings. And uh, it's really a kind of update, a revisiting of something that I put together uh, back in the mid 90s. Um, and uh, as, I, as I started looking at it again, I realized that actually I, I, I have very little understanding, actual realization of what it is that, that uh, the Bhagavatam particularly is saying about the topic of time. And so I've tried to get back to the basics and see, uh, just, just see what it is that I can actually understand from what it's saying. and and. I think yesterday a couple of a couple of speakers talked about uh, the 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 process of acquiring this kind of knowledge is not simply academic study, but it involves um, part, partaking or participating in the in the practice of uh, back to yoga, Krishna consciousness, as Prabhupada taught the process. And so, over the last few years, I've been fortunate in that I've had a bit more time to focus on my, uh, you know, improving my chanting and reading and so on, in the hope that Krishna will uh, decide to benedict me with a bit of understanding. Now, I can't say that uh, I've been doing that well, but um, I, I will try to share what I have um, I've got so far. Um, all right, so. I'm taking a cultural perspective because that's really kind of most of my background. And so, what, you know, we, we, we talk about Vedic culture as it's been taught to us by Prabhupada coming from the Gaudiya Vaishnava line. What is, what is time, what's the importance of time in that culture? Um, so the culture, the, 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 the participants of that culture appear to have monitored time for a number of reasons. Uh, all throughout Prabhupada's books, you find mention of auspicious and inauspicious times for doing things. And in fact, you know, the, the culture that we've learned from Prabhupada uh, involves much of that kind of thing, uh, doing things at the right time, uh, going, you know, going to Mangalati, because that's the best time to be engaging in that kind of activity and so on. Um, 
there's also astrology has has a big um, has, uh, part to play in Vedic culture. Um, that uh, personalities who, like, like Srila Prabhupada, for example, who appear at a certain time, there's there's a there's there's a certain amount of um, information that can be uh, determined about such persons because by because of the time that they appear and so on. Not just great personalities, but everybody. So astrology is is an important aspect of the culture. Of course, you have to have um, time measurement in order to uh, engage in astrological computations. And then just generally, uh, the Vedic uh, scriptures seem to seem to be telling us that there's you know we're 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 subject to a schedule of events on a cosmic scale that um, are not just random, but that we also, that it's, it's something that we, we have no control over. It's going to happen. It's happening that way and it's going to happen. And we're um, going along for the ride. So for the, this was also written um, as a, as a, as, as a kind of, it's a, it's a work in progress, but the idea is that this is this, this presentation is going to end up as a, as a paper that can be presented to the uh, non devotee academic community. And so a cultural approach uh, is a good way of, another good way of uh, doing that. And I took this, this is a nice quote that I found years ago from a book called The World of the Ancient Maya, where the author uh, explains to the readers uh, the, the approach necessary for getting some understanding of this ancient culture. It's a really nice quote. And it can be equally applied to Vedic culture as we have received it when we are trying to present it to an academic audience, that Maya reality differs radically from most others. It's difficult for the outsider to appreciate these seemingly bizarre notions as a coherent functional system of integrated beliefs. Every society believes that its own version of reality is real and classes others as, others as fantasy, charming perhaps, but surely distorted. To escape this trap, one must suspend disbelief to a degree that strains the rationalist mind. Yet only so is it possible to begin to achieve the empathy necessary to enter at least a little way into the Maya universe. And so I think the, the same thing really can apply to what we are talking about to our culture when we're presenting it to outsiders. So when it comes to time, a um, very important uh, factor here is the R or R, the three Vishnus and Lord Brahma. So this is a, a core component of um, the cosmology that's found throughout Prabhupada's books. It's mentioned over and over again in the Chaitanya Charitamrita and the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's also in the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's lectures, Prabhupada's conversations. It's it's like a major thing um, because it's presented so frequently and in, in you know in, in different ways even. So the three Vishnus, um, that whole transformation sequence that uh, uh, especially uh, some details in the Adilila of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, but this, the, the, the transformations that take place in, 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 in the energies involved in the forces and so on, uh, involving the, these three Vishnus, they appear in a sequence that seems to represent the emergence and flowering of the material cosmos. So it starts with the spiritual energy and involves transformations of this energy. And uh, Brahma is 
linked with these three Vishnus. And uh, he is the, the manager of the, the Brahmanda, the, what Prabhupada calls the universe. And, Pra and Brahma's lifetime corresponds to the, the life of the universe. So the first of these, I'm just going to quickly, because this was talked about yesterday, Karnadakshai Vishnu. And so it's the breathing of this, of Mahavishnu in, in his yoga nidra, his eternal slumber, um, that is uh, and the resultant alternate manifestation and destruction of the universes, the Brahmandas, that has drawn comparisons with um, the cyclical theories of the universe in physics in the past. And so you have uh, in the creation process, you've got Karnavakshay Vishnu and the Mahakalpa creations, which are you know, the, from which the Brahmandas come. Then within each Brahmanda, you have uh, uh, Karnavakshay Vishnu expands as Garbhadakshay Vishnu, uh, whose creations are termed the Vikalpa creations, and it's Lord Brahma is. Um, Produced by Garbhadakshay Vishnu and then um, Shirdakshay Vishnu um, enters into um, uh, or is present alongside each living entity within each atom, etc. Um, interestingly, there are um, places where Paramat or Shirdakshay Vishnu is, is equated with time itself. In other words, it's, it's actually said that, Sh that Shiradakshay Vishnu is time. And also that um, uh, that the Shiradakshay Vishnu is causes the movements of everything in the material creation. So I thought that was interesting. Time and motion. So the universe is this tiered universe that um, has been described multiple times as well. And uh, I'm saying that uh, based on Saraputta Prabhu's understanding, and it's, it seems to be to me to be correct, that the planetary systems in the Vedic culture are classified according to the levels of consciousness in a tiered system with 14 levels. And Earth is part of the middle planetary system. Each, uh, that was a quote was given yesterday, control, each system is controlled by a different color chakra or schedule of eternal time. Then we have the time dilation, which has been also discussed and um, something I've had further thoughts on that I'm not gonna talk about now, but the, the higher stratum, the higher the stratum in the material universe, the greater the time dilation and on the highest level, the entire duration of the universe is experienced as a hundred years or one lifetime. So that's from Mars level. And um, just one day and night on the highest level is to us is uh, 8 billion, 640 million years. That's, that's uh, from Mars day and from Mars night added together on, on our level. So there's, there's a lot of potential um, there for further, uh, research on, uh, along the lines of, uh, I think, uh, what Major Kavinda Prabhu was uh, talking about in, in previous presentation. So the time divisions then are expressed in terms of the breathing of Mahavishnu, the Mahakalpas, in terms of Brahma's lifetime, and in terms of the relative movement of the sun. So we, 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 this is just sort of classification of the types of time divisions that we see given in the Bhagavatam. Arpad uh, also provides solar year equivalents for larger time units up to the age of the universe. And the smallest divisions, um, very nice presentation yesterday, um, covered this, but uh, 
smallest divisions are calculated according to the time taken for the sun to pass over the smallest particles or atoms. Again, atoms being used by Prabhupad because you know, it's the tiniest particle, but doesn't necessarily equate to what an atom is considered to be in physics. But nevertheless, it's the idea of you know, it's the smallest particle. And uh, so question, a, lot of, a lot of these things actually give me more questions than answers. Um, for example, um, about possible astron astronomical events that might be represented by the largest time divisions that we, um, even you know, the physicists and astronomers can only really, really speculate about this kind of thing. But um, do they correspond to something that happens in uh, our 3D universe on a, on a cosmic, more cosmic scale? And also how these, a lot of the little time divisions that we will see um, are there practical ways that these very tiny, very small time divisions could have been measured in Vedic times? Um, because even now, if, if, we, if we wanted to measure a millisecond um, without very expensive equipment, there's no way we could do it. Uh, so, you know, these time divisions are there in, in this culture, but, you know, how were they used? So, um, years, so back in that um, mid-90s presentation, I came up with these diagrams to show the cyclical nature of um, these different time divisions. So, the first circle here represents... Um, the lifetime of Brahma on the right hand semicircle with the kind of red and these red and yellow. Um, each one is a, each one of those divisions there is a, is a year in the life of Brahma, that's 100 years. And then for the same amount of time, um, that's the when everything's uh, vesting in, in the body of Mahavishnu. And then, so if we take one of those years and show that as a cycle as well. Then we have a year of Brahma made up of 12 of his months, uh, which comes to 360 kalpas, just like we have 360 days in the Vedic year. So um, there are 360 kalpas or days of Brahma in the year of Brahma. So if we take one of those months and break it up into uh, Alpas or days of Brahma, then we get that. And then each day of Brahma, then this is a day of Brahma. So this represents 24 hours of Brahma's time, one night and day. So we have the day represented by 14 Manvantars, and then this uh, period in which everything is kind of up to certain planetary systems is, is devastated. If we take one of the Manvantaras, uh, then uh, we see that a Manvantara is composed of 71 Divya Yugas or Yuga cycles with a Sandhya or transitional period equivalent in length to one Satya Yuga. So then if we take one of those give you yugas, one of those yuga cycles, and we look at it, then we have this unusual um, uh, arrangement where the parts of the cycle are not equal. They're in the ratio of four, three, two, and one. And uh, so Satya Yuga, Dvapara Yuga, Dreta Yuga, Kali Yuga. And so a thousand of these, going back to um, Lord Brahma's day, a thousand of these makes one day of Brahma. So actually, although we're, talk we're looking at these as circles, we're kind of looking at it end on. If we look at them, they're not actually really circles, they're parts of a spiral. Because as we go through one, through, through one full circle, 
we don't get back to the beginning because time has moved on in a linear sense almost um but not quite uh so that there is there is a forward progression of these cycles so it's actually more like a coil and then this coil of course is is this little bit of coil here is part of a much bigger coil there, there these are coils within coils within coils uh, in this model of um, the passage of time So these dev devastations and dissolutions um, that occur periodically in this system uh, are not equal in terms of severity. So you get a complete destruction of the universe, whatever that happens to be in, in astronomical terms, um, at the end of Brahma's lifetime. There are partial devastations or dissolutions at the junctions between the major time divisions, such as, whoops, Brahma's night, the junctions or sandhyas between the manvantaras, the transitions at the end of each Divya Yuga even. So again, what possible astronomical events might correspond to devastations? Would be a question that I would ask, I am asking, I have no answer to. So a quick summary of the time divisions here. So then in this column, you see Earth's, Earth years or solar years. Here you've got demigod time equivalents. Here that you've got the Manus and over here, Lord Brahma's uh, time. And so that just kind of summarizes um, collections of information that um, come from Prabhupada's books. And uh, Again, there's, I think there's a lot of scope for uh, working with these, the, these differences between demigod time and earth time and Lord Brahma's time and so on to get a better understanding of uh, what the Brahmanda actually is and where everything is. Okay, and then the, the four yugas. There's some details about each one. Um, in the diagram, I showed the different yugas in different colors corresponding to the yuga avatars that appear in each. And uh, here's the durations in both demigod years and solar years. So this is just, just, just a way of kind of um, uh, just getting down on paper. What is it that's actually there in Prabhupada's books about these kind of details? This, um, of all of the things that I mentioned time, uh, this happens to be, to me anyway, the thing that makes the most sense. These two verses in the fifth canto of chapter 21, um, the chariot of the sun god has only one wheel, which is known as Samvatsara. The 12 months are calculated to be its 12 spokes. The six seasons are the sections of its rim. And the three Chattamasu periods are its three section hub. One side of the axle carrying the wheel rests upon the summit of Mount Samiru, and the other rests upon Manasotra Mountain. Affixed to the outer end of the axle, the wheel continuously rotates on Manasotra Mountain like the wheel of an oil pressing machine. As in an oil pressing machine, this first axle is attached to, the sec to a second axle which is one fourth as long, which is one fourth as long. The upper end of this second axle is attached to the Loka by a rope of wind. So this, you know, it's, it's very sort of poetic. Um, my, my conclusion is that it's, um, it is, it's a metaphor, and I believe Salaputta Prabhu says the same thing. Um, but trying to translate that into it, it's actually okay. So this diagram here just translates it into a, a wheel, right? So you, it's very nicely explained in the in the fifth canto. So if you put all these um, the names of the different seasons, the months, that's what it looks like. And this three sectioned hub of the three Chaturmasya periods. Um, but if this is supposed to, I'll come back to this slide in a second. 
the, the kind of oil pressing machine, it seems to be this kind of design. Here you have the first axle around which you've got this stone wheel rotating. And here's the second axle atop Mount Sumero. And as, as the person, you can see that as a person pushes this round and the wheel rotates around the first fixed axle, um, this second axle will rotate. So this is, this is an oil pressing machine, but as I've put a title here, it's a Mediterranean style of oil pressing machine for um, uh, pressing olive olives. Um, now, if we go back to this diagram, if this wheel is going to rotate around Manasotra Mountain with um, Mount Meru in the, at one end of the axle, but then uh, the, the size of this wheel, the circumference of this wheel is going to have to equal the circumference of Manasotara Mountain with Mount Sumeru in the center. So it's going to be, have to be a gigantic wheel. Another reason why this appears to be a metaphor. Um, there, there are versions, uh, uh, versions of this kind of um, oil pressing machine that have big wheels that you can see. You could, it, it's, it's not unrealistic to see that it's possible to have um, a size of uh, bowl here um, with a circumference that's kind of the same as the size of the wheel. You could have a big enough wheel and it'll go around in this kind of oil pressing machine. Um, going back to this diagram though, it makes really good sense to me if you pop Mount Meru in the center and kind of flip it uh, onto its side. And, um, and there you, you, and then you would have the sun going around the outside of it. Um, if, if, this, if this was flat on Bumandala, uh, it would make a really good sense. And then if you put the signs of the zodiac around the outside to show the, which constellations the sun is in at particular parts of the year, uh, then it, it really kind of, it really works that way, whether or not you have a gigantic version of it kind of trundling around the outside or not. Um, and it really, to me also lends weight to the idea that Bumandala uh, corresponds in space to the plane of the ecliptic as Sariputta Prabhu um, presented. Um, okay, so then going back to these oil pressing machines, the only problem is, is here's a different kind of similar machine that is um, from Mexico. Um, Indian oil pressing machines don't appear to be like that. They don't have wheels. Um, so I'm wondering, that's, that's really kind of puzzling me. I, I searched and searched and searched and could not find a picture of an Indian oil pressing machine that looks anything like the Mediterranean one. Um, they all look, they're, they're all different versions of this where they've got this um, plank here with a kind of fork on the end. It's, it's like a great big mortar and pestle. So you've got this big mortar here with a kind of groove in it there for, for this plank to be able to move around. And um, you've got this arrangement here of, that puts pressure on this pestle as this whole contraption is turned around. And, and the pressure is provided by these blown blocks of stone here, as well as the operator sitting on the end here. So this, that pushes the plank down, it pulls this down, it pushes that down and creates the pressure as it's turning to grind the seeds and, and, and like sesame seeds or mustard seeds um, to produce the oil. But it doesn't have a wheel. You could kind of stick a wheel on it, I suppose, but it's definitely not, uh, you know, because you could stick a wheel on it and have somebody pushing it or even have the oxen still pushing it. But, um, the wheel would actually prevent it from working because it would stop the plank from being able to be depressed uh, hard enough to make this uh, work properly. So 
unless there used to be in you know in Neolithic times a kind of oil pressing machine that was more like this, um, it's 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 strange to me that uh, that verse um, compares uh, the sun god's wheel uh, you know, with an oil pressing machine. So that's something. Um, confused about and want to find more about um, archaeology of India. Okay, so then there are standard, smaller, stand, smaller standard units of time in Vedic culture. These were given in a table yesterday. Um, this is more, more or less everything that was in that table. I might swipe the earlier bits and the later bits from that if, if um, my uh, uh, Okay, compatriot, uh, I mean, sorry, my colleague would uh, not mind. Um, but this, this is just straight out of uh, Canto 3, Chapter 11, these different uh, uh, units are listed. Um, the important one for me is the danda, because there is a description of how to measure a danda. It's to take a copper part first and then drill a certain size hole in it and then stick in a bowl of water and, and see how long it takes to to sink, and that's a, a way of measuring um, a danda. But how, how, again, how do you actually measure a truti or a veda in you know, the kind of tiny units here? Um, it says what they are, but how do you, how do you practically, how do you measure it? Um, the bigger ones, of course, it's a, a bit easier. And so putting those in the, in the table, um, the, the, we, we, there are two different durations for each for these um, kind of presented by Prabhupada. Uh, in there's one verse in um, in the third sorry in the third canto where Prabhupada in the purport um, gives gives the equivalent. It gives he says as far as time is concerned, we beg to subjoin. Here with a table of timings in terms of the modern clock. And so that's where this lot comes from. And of course, they're different from the Vedic times because Prabhupada's kind of rounding them to the, the units that we use uh, in, the, in the West nowadays. Um, so this is not the only time that Prabhupada kind of uh, does this kind of thing, sort of rough equivalents um, of these Vedic measurements, that these, these are the ones that, uh, that uh, correspond to the actual uh, Vedic, uh, Vedic time. Um, so my concluding notes, actually just the other times, other times that Prabhupada, um, in relation to time, uh, I did find that and you probably have found it too. That, for example, uh, the uh, for the length of a I think I said is it a divya yuga? Am I getting this right now? Let me go back to my own table. Um, yeah, for the length of a for the, for the length of a divya yuga, um, four million. Prabhupada gives two different. Um, sets of figures based on, on, on the length of a divya yuga. Um, when he's when he's wanted to give, uh, when, he, when his purpose is just to give kind of you know rough estimate, he'll say uh, four, four billion three hundred million, and and he'll use he'll use when he's discussing this he'll use the word about and lakhs, so, many, so he's rounding things to so many lakhs of, of uh, miles, and uh, sorry, years. And then when he's being more precise, when he wants to be more precise, then he'll give this figure. So um, that's another example of Prabhupada giving rough figures uh, in certain situations. Okay, so my concluding notes is that the Vedic time system as we've received it from Prabhupada can be divided into two components. The first being divisions of time that are literally on a cosmic scale and for which there would be no observable measures for practical purposes, although they can be calculated in terms of 
time divisions that are observable. Then there are divisions of time measurable with observable events, such as the apparent movement of the sun in the sky or the time taken for a bowl with a hole in it to fill with water. Small and large time units are calculated with reference to the sun and even the smallest, which would be too brief to notice with the unaided human minds and senses, um, are related to the movement of the sun over minute particles beginning with the smallest, the atom. Um, so the Vedic texts, again summarizing, seem to envisage forces and energies at work in the cosmos in terms of personalities. These are either versions of the supreme personality or parts and parcels of that personality, each playing their parts in the grand cosmic drama of the material world. The scale of events in this drama can be compared with current understanding of under understandings of modern science, despite the seemingly disparate worldviews of Vedic culture and Western science. So some of the presenters have been doing just that. Um, Kaupad uses commonly understood English words as approximate translations for Sanskrit terms that conceptually do not necessarily have an exact English equivalent. For example, atom, universe, planetary system, species, evolution, etc. Okay. Um, that's it.